Some people eat too much food. Others eat unhealthy food, perhaps because they cannot afford healthy alternatives. Other people continue to eat a balanced diet, but still struggle with their weight. How we eat and how our bodies react to food greatly affects our health. More than a third of all deaths today are caused by diseases such as obesity and type 2 diabetes. But why does the body tell us that it wants more food, even though it has enough energy? And can you get the body to settle for what it needs by adjusting the body's control systems? These questions have puzzled researchers for decades, and translating new knowledge into something to combat these diseases turned out to be extremely challenging. In the 1990s, as the obesity pandemic spreads, even young people start to lose their ability to keep their body weight and blood glucose in balance. In turn, researchers and pharmaceutical companies set out to find new remedies. In 1989, the young biotechnologist Lotte Bjerre Knudsen gets a job at one of these companies, Denmark's Novo Nordisk, where she and her team screen thousands of compounds for a potential effect. But after taking maternity leave in 1994, she returned to a rather changed workplace. It was a little bit lonely, I have to say that, because many of the people that I kind of grew up with in, in this, the first team that I worked with, they were just gone. During her maternity leave, Novo Nordisk runs into a major issue. The US Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, has established that the production of insulin in some factories is in danger of being polluted by the adjacent production of penicillin. All efforts are thrown into cleaning up both the production and the organization. But something else also happened to me while I was on maternity leave, and of course I became a mother. For me, that kind of meant that I was a woman on a mission. Lotte Bjerre Knudsen has also got a new boss. I was told by the CEO that we have an innovation problem. We have a pipeline that's very empty. So when I, in 1994, uh, aged 33 years old, uh, took over research and development, I was basically given the task to create a pipeline within diabetes and not just have one or two insulin products. That was the job. But Lotte Bjerre Knudsen's colleagues are skeptical that she could come up with a solution. When they looked at me, they saw a, a very young woman, quite uh, junior, actually, in a way. And also, I didn't have a PhD. So I'm sure that some people looked down at me uh, for that. We were looking at various ideas for treatment of type 2 diabetes. We had contact to several different people outside Novo Nordisk. And one of them was Jens Juhl Holst at, uh, at Copenhagen University. Jens Juhl Holst's path into the world of diabetes started 20 years earlier, as the newly graduated Danish doctor was deciding what to do. Surgery is at the top of the list. The chief surgeon was appointed professor in those days, which was a big thing. So. Um, so we were planning on a, on a career also for me in, in that way. Then we got news about a person who was interested in gut hormones. At Bispebjerg Hospital, uh, Jens Reifeldt is the name, and uh, I was sent to him. But not much other than the subject was set. They built a, a barrack, uh, an empty shell, and we got a laboratory, and the only instrument in that laboratory was a sink and leftovers from the clinical file chemistry department. Holst was interested in the hot topic of the time, stomach ulcers. But Jens Reifeld had slightly different plans for the newly qualified doctor. And one of the reasons for that was that he had made a new friend at Novo Nordisk, and that friend was Lisa Heating. What then happened was that uh, Novo Nordisk came in trouble, trouble with the washing enzymes that they were selling in the United States. So everybody was uh, directed to solve these problems, and Lisa Heating could no longer work with the glucagon business. So I took over where she left. 
his hormone now became glucagon and the disease became diabetes. Glucagon and insulin work together to balance a person's blood glucose levels. While insulin ensures that excess glucose in the bloodstream, and thus energy, can be stored in the liver, muscles and fat tissue, glucagon can release glucose when the body lacks energy. This balance is tipped when there is too little insulin and too much glucagon in the body. People with type 2 diabetes have a relative deficiency of insulin and a relative excess of glucagon. What you need is more insulin and less glucagon. Something puzzled Jens Juhl Holst when he performed stomach surgery. We had some of these patients in the department that developed too low blood glucose after meals. By using radioactivity labeled antibodies, the researchers could find out where the action was. We could see some cells that would light up, but of course the antibodies do not immediately tell what is in the cell. To their great surprise, the intestines only lit up when antibodies against glucagon were used. Two glucagon-like molecules were extracted and the structures identified. Then came the, the new era of molecular biology. And that's where Joel Hebner come into the picture. Because Joel Hebner, he was a bit of a giant in the new molecular biology. A new technology had evolved called recombinant DNA technology. And uh, that made it very easy to determine the structure of a protein or a peptide like glucagon or insulin. There was a concern that the artificially made DNA could get into the sewer system and be become a hazard to people. The researchers were only allowed to proceed if they used cold-blooded animals, such as anglerfish. The anglerfish has an advantage in that the endocrine pancreas is a single body of tissue. Uh, it's called the Brockman body. So you don't have to go through the isolation of the hormone-producing islet tissue. This also meant that the number of genetic templates for the two new hormones, messenger RNAs, were also greatly concentrated. The hidden peptide, it was very similar to glucagon, but it was a glucagon-like peptide, but also resembled the sequence of another a hormone that uh, known to stimulate insulin secretion. Later, in 1983, the corresponding DNA sequences were also found in humans. In 1986, researchers demonstrated that the function of the glucagon-like hormone was in fact altered in people with type 2 diabetes. This is one of the contributory mechanisms for their diabetes. And that was quite a, a sensational discovery. Later, it turned out that GLP-1 not only stimulated insulin, but also inhibited glucagon secretion, but still, it was too early to conclude that diabetes could be treated by giving GLP-1 artificially. What made the impact was the fact that there actually was clinical data in people with type 2 diabetes. One thing is to know it in the laboratory setting. Another thing is to know that it actually is the case also in real people with diabetes. What happened was that in the diabetes care division, I met Lotte. She was very... Uh, vigorously wanting to show me this brand new paper that showed that if you actually infuse GLP-1 into the human body, you, you can really lower blood glucose, blood sugar, in a fantastic way. It seemed like a, a wonder molecule. However, a dampener was quickly put on the enthusiasm. Converting GLP-1 into a drug seemed almost impossible. A well, native GLP-1 has the problem of being extremely short-acting. It's like you, you give an injection to a person and it will last for about five minutes, right? So it's, it's not a good drug candidate. It ended up showing that it gave skin reactions. So we kind of had to think the project over. Then Matthew said, oh, that GLP-1 project, you figure it out because you're kind of like the only one left who knows uh, what it's about. Thank you.